if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Emma Filipoff series, episode 5, More Theories. We are going to examine even more theories in that mysterious Emma Filipoff case. And this is a disappearance that is, uh... Quite perplexing, for lack of a better word, and uh, like many other missing persons cases, of course, closure and resolution, obviously, for her family and for her, if she is indeed the victim of some kind of a crime, is, of course, uh, the goal in this case, as well as all missing persons cases and unsolved uh, cases. And we will be continuing the examination here in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront. I'm, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire. And if you want to help support the Mind Shock podcast, help get us, help get more mind shocking content out there and keep up awareness in all these types of cases, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co podcast or requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. So I am actually going to go over some posts here by a PI just to set the stage here. Of course... If you haven't checked out the first four episodes, check those out because we lay the groundwork and go over all available information in this case. And now we are going to examine further still even more wrinkles in the case and other possibilities and clues not yet discussed in this case. So a uh, Redditor by the name of Magnum posted this. I'm a former PI in Ontario. I have started investigating this case looking for anything that might have been missed. I'm doing this as a project in my spare time. Anything I find that may have been passed on or discovered yet to an acquaintance of the mother. I have passed on small things that I think might eventually be potentially important down the road. If anyone has anything that they want to know, please contact me. Want to let me know, please contact me. I have no interest in the reward. I just do this for two reasons. Just as a project, as I have an interest in missing persons cases, and I would like to see the family have answers to what happened to Emma. I am interested in any pictures, emails, and even hear about anything regarding her life and disappearance. I have been going through several videos, podcasts, and articles, all of which are very basic and repetitive. If anyone from the Victoria area has anything to add, please contact me. Thanks. So someone asked here, what, what have others overlooked? Response, I've just looked at maps possible paths or trails she may have taken if she was the one in fact that dropped the prepaid visa card been in the pi field and security industry you also learn to read people's body language and behaviors i pointed out that the bank card was found in an area across the road from a casino i worked as security in a casino owned by the same company great canadian gaming corporation they often owe offer free soda and coffee at their casinos. If they were open during the time Emma was in the area, she may have gone in to get a drink. Plus, they always have cameras inside and out. They may have caught her walking somewhere, confirming she was actually in this area, thus increasing the timeline and last known area of travel. However, it's up to Victoria PD to do this, but they are not very proactive in this case for some reason and very reluctant to give or provide any details. And I actually went over this in the previous episodes, too, on how there's some shady business going on between certain groups in this area, the government, the police. I mean, there's a lot of shady business going on, and of course, that can uh, impede certain investigations, even if, um, again, I'm not claiming any government officials are responsible for disappearance, whether they are or they are not. Even if they are not, there could still be some elements that just are not interested in pursuing this and will not allocate res resources to do such, possibly based on people Emma may have been affiliated with who had a pretty anti-government uh, slant or whatnot. Continuing on here, and I don't necessarily believe in the mental health breakdown. I believe that mercury poisoning could be a very strong possibility. 
I urged them to find hair samples in Emma's belongings and have them tested. The symptoms are very close to action signs and behaviors exhibited by Emma. By determining this could change the perspective of how people are looking at the case. And we addressed some of that as well in previous episodes. Another post here by Kayan. Hello, I live close to Emma's hometown. I don't have any info on the case except what is known by everyone else, but I am very interested in your theory and would love to know more if you are willing to share. I think you make some great points, and I wish the Victoria PD would look into it more and take this case more seriously. I wonder why they are so closed about it and not willing to offer more information or help. Kind of odd to me. Also, going back to the casino angle, yeah, you would think of obviously any legitimate investigation would have checked the security uh, at the casino. But not just that, but also interview people at the casino, because if they do give out free drinks, and Emma may, I mean, just knowing whether Emma would have gone in there, even if it was a different day, just to kind of establish known paths of travel and move from there and then try to trace that timeline, or if anything else, just find more people that might have seen Emma. Either that day or previous days, just again, just for more information. The more information you have, the, the more you can investigate. Another post here, I wonder if anyone else have, has been to Callwood and asked locals about Emma or if anyone there actually does know her and confirm that she was headed there. Uh, this case just drives me nuts. I think the casino theory is very interesting and could very well be possible. I wish I had means to get to Victoria and I would honestly do some of my own investigating. The cadaver dog's got nothing on the most recent search. However, another one is due this spring, I believe. I would love to get out there and help. And these are old posts, so not recent. Magnum responded, if you do a search for Emma, I have posted quite a bit, plus I have offered a few theories. I don't publicly release all information I come across as I don't want to steer possible scenarios in the wrong direction until I can confirm and research many of my own findings. When I do find something or I have a sound theory, I notify the Find Emma Instagram page. Okay. So another poster wrote this, uh, user right place, W-R-I-T-E. The privacy laws have been a stumbling block for sure, but I can see how important they are, especially in this case. There is info that just can't be released for Emma's sake. There are clues in the journal, which the search team was privy to, specifically a page labeled first day of spring 2012. It's a massive clue. Not sure who are you referring to that lives in Victoria and knows her. Chances are the search team has spoken with him. It should be noted that before Emma went missing, she lived in Campbell River, but also Karema, Karemos and spent a brief time in Nelson, British Columbia, where she attended Shambhala. She had relatives there and several reports of a hitchhiker matching her description reported to RCMP summer 2013. She could be anywhere, especially if the green shirt guy does know her and he has status. She has a serious interest in native culture. So... I don't know if we talked about that extensively, the interest in native culture and how that might affect if she did make it out of the area and where she would be staying after all of this. Is there a native connection we don't know about or other native friends? And she might even possibly be staying uh, on a res reservation or something like that. Now, I couldn't really find any info on Native American connections, but if she is happy and living on on some kind of Native American reservation, or was for a period of time, and then, you know, got in a certain position or place where she could have moved on again, all according to her own will. Perhaps it's all by design, and she asked for those, you know, the people that helped her, if, again, this was connected to some kind of Native American angle, to not reveal this information. So, if that's the case, I mean, that could possibly explain that, but here's something we haven't talked about, and this has actually bothered me for, uh, for quite some time. There's there's a there's a timeline issue here. So I've talked about the van and I, I do think that figuring out the van situation is critical in the timeline. Again, whether she disappeared of her own volition or something bad happened to her. Or again, the theory that she did disappear of her own free will, everything was fine, and then however, whatever period of time later, if she was harmed, it was way, 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 way later, months later, so it has nothing to do with the specific uh, instances in the time immediately preceding her disappearance. Although again, I wouldn't bet on it. Again, I'm not claiming anything is true or untrue. This is mind shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But Emma Filipov, 
has technically been missing since November 28th, 2012, from the front of the Empress Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia. November 28th, 2012. So, in her possessions, in the van, is her Canon 40D, a semi-pro DSLR that was a gift from her mother. On the camera card, several por several portraits. So the last ones were taken in spring 2012. So she hadn't used it since spring. So she goes missing November 28th. These portraits taken, uh, actually the latest one, supposedly June 3rd, 2012. If the data is accurate here. We have May 16th and June 3rd. And then nothing for months. So... It's kind of, I don't know, that, that that seems to be a little bit of an issue. Now, did she have another camera? Or this was the nice camera, but why? So it's in her van. Would she really leave without her possessions? That's another issue there. Or was she just so frustrated she couldn't get the van back? There was a tow situation. We went over all these uh, possibilities. She's trying to get the van back. I mean, we went over this in the previous episode, so check those out. There could be issues there, but... Yeah, there's, there's a little bit more info here on this November 28th, 2020 article on VancouverIsland.ctvnews.ca. Uh, Have you seen Emma Filipov? New photos released on eight-year anniversary of her disappearance. And also, Ontario cold case search spans the country for missing Emma Filipov, Orangeville.com. This is from September 5th, 2019. Some excerpts here. In the days leading up to Emma's disappearance, Kimberly learned a lot of her movements, including one of her last entries in Emma's journal dated November 23rd, 2012. Sleep deep hurts. Checked myself out. Mom is coming. It's November 23rd. Have to get home before dad goes. I want to call dad. You're going home tomorrow. According to Shelley, Emma's father, James Philippoff, an artist, keeps to himself and hasn't talked to anyone about the search for his daughter after a CBC Fifth Estate episode, which aired December 23rd, 2014. He doesn't want to talk about it, Shelley said. And again, before people jump on that, like maybe he does know what happened and Emma left of her own free will and he knows that, whatever. Or, again, if this affected him that deeply, he doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, both scenarios are clearly very plausible. I mean, and you see both in missing persons cases, so. James did say on the television broadcast that whatever happened to Emma, he hoped it was her choice. And again, so he didn't completely never talk to anybody ever. He did make that statement. It's also possible she might have contacted, if she, disapp if she disappeared of her own free will, uh, she may have contacted him since then, after, 20, after his appearance on the Fifth Estate. So, or these interviews, wherever these quotes are taken from. So these, uh, that's a possibility as well, and he didn't want to talk after she had contacted him and told him not to talk about it. So again, we have many different possible scenarios here. Emma's possessions. So... In the original search of Emma's van, found her camera, a Canon 40D semi-pro DSLR that was a gift from her mother. On the camera card were several self-portraits, the latest ones taken in spring 2012, which have been used in media releases and newscasts. She was a very adept photographer, Shelley said. She studied photojournalism before she studied culinary arts. She was working as a chef slash cook in Campbell River for three years. The only reason she stopped is because she has a congenital knee disorder and it was bothering her back, her back a lot. A chef is on her feet all day long. She terminated her employment to come home and see our orthopedic surgeon in 2011 and then headed back out west in September 2011. She hasn't been home since. Okay, so this little detail, I actually don't remember going over that. So here we do have... So we have a history here. So she wasn't afraid to come home. She had she had went home unless uh, unless some people, the people that say that she had issues with the family, et cetera, et cetera, unless some more issues happened when she went home then. But clearly at that time in September 2011, if this is all verified, she actually so she left her job. So she has a congenital knee disorder, and it bothers her back. 
So for the so what's with all of so again after she got this uh, so she went to see the orthopedic surgeon. What happened with the orthopedic surgeon? I mean, did they do something? Did they fix that issue? And then she was able to walk all this time after that. And if they didn't fix that issue, I mean, because supposedly she takes all these long walks. So I mean, these are critical details as well. Okay, another critical detail here. I don't know if they're reading from the diary entry that that PI referred to, but this is right at the beginning of Emma Filipov, the fifth estate. Her life is about to change forever. 26-year-old Emma Filipov is seen here on the store's surveillance camera. She comes in to buy a cell phone, but watch her. She's in no rush to leave the store. Pacing back and forth to the door, looking out. What is out there? Is she hiding from someone? Or is it all in her mind? Her journal entries reveal her growing fear. I feel like there's someone following me. A car on the hill when I rose and then drove as I walked by and paused in the street. I feel weird sometimes. I feel like I'm being stalked. So she feels like she's being followed and stalked. Now, here's the thing. A lot of coincidence theorists and these just weak-minded, illogical people, they think there's some kind of magical Dungeons & Dragons spell that protects people that might be having mental issues or drug issues from any kind of foul play in the universe. Like, somehow, all serial killers or people who are willing to assault criminal-minded individuals, ex-boyfriends, whatever, somehow there's some kind of magical spell that if she is having some kind of paranoid delusions or mental health issues, that somehow, magically, she would not be harmed. I mean, I don't know where this comes from. You see this in the true crime community. There's like, you know, certain, uh, a certain Dunning-Kruger crowd that kind of facilitates these explanations where they're like, oh, no, no, she wasn't harmed because she's having mental health issues or drug issues. Like, if anything, that would increase her chances of being met by foul play. Because some of these criminal scumbags, they, they like weaker targets. So if they know that the gullible goofs will easily dismiss this case by saying, oh, it was a drug or mental health issue and not investigate, they know that there's a lot of clueless goofs out there. So it's kind of like the same thing how murderers stage suicides. They know a lot of the clueless goof bereft of logic and reason crowd. They'll just write it off. Oh, suicide, suicide, no need for investigation. Just like in cases where people might ha be having mental health or drug issues, which again, I'm not convinced that Emma Filipov was. And neither is this PI. Neither are a lot of people. But even if she was, does that increase the likelihood that she would be met with foul play at the hands of some scumbag? So if these, it, there's no date here on these journal entries that they're going over, but she feels like she's being followed and stalked. Now, she, she did happen to have this guy move across the country, coincidentally, who also happened to see her three times the day she disappeared. I mean, I don't know what everybody makes of that. We went over him extensively, this Julian character. Uh, we're not going to go into him again, but yeah, just if she is feeling like she's being stalked, whether she is or she isn't, there could be some kind of foundation there and not just hallucinations. Maybe they're just unwanted advances by certain individuals, Julian, or otherwise, or others. Maybe there's more than one person following her around. Maybe one of them might possibly do her harm, the other might not, but she gets more and more aware. You know, what was that quote from Stephen King? Perfect paranoia is perfect awareness. So if there's one or two or three people following her, maybe not even really following her, but if she keeps seeing them, I mean, that would make anybody kind of seem suspicious. And then when there's a car or whatever she might just assume it's all the same guy and there could be two or three guys and one or two of them might be totally innocent per se or at least wouldn't harm her but the other one maybe not or even if they're all relatively innocent and they wouldn't harm her that could get her thinking this way and then someone else harmed her either way i mean that is very very curious and we do have to keep that in mind so there is an interview here. This was a uh, nighttime podcast, March 11th, 2021, episode 10, The Shelter. And in this episode, they interviewed Patty, a woman who stayed at the shelter and knew Emma Philippa. Hi, Patty. Hi, how are you? 
how are you? Good, how are you? This is like uh, returning back to 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 a lot of things. Yeah, well, let's say... So, I, want, I publicly want to apologize for insulting you yesterday so much. That's, that's okay. I have a, a what they call a thick skin. And I, I know that uh, I know it wasn't anything personal. It's a, this is a sensitive story and a sensitive topic. I was really insulting you. I was very upset because I find some people that are doing videos about Emma. Hmm. And I got to you. That's how I, uh, and again, but you know me from a long time ago already, actually. Yeah, we've, we've spoke before a, a, f a few years ago when I was really researching Emma's story. I, I tried to, to contact you, but I think I think at that point you were um, just in the middle of moving, I believe. There was something going on. I know you're not originally from Victoria. How did you end up in Victoria back, back then? What, what brought you to Victoria? Well, my husband is from Canada. Um... Our children are half Canadian, half Spanish. Ended up in the shelter because he already had a car accident, so he had something in the mind to like distortions. I called the Ministry of Children to help me because the father was saying certain things, and then the father he acted like a gentleman so they took the children away from me and gave it to him for this six months period uh, when i was in the shelter and um i went um later they took it from him and because they realized from many people that uh, he ha he's not a bad person he just had a car accident and david would be normal and then he would have what they call it an episode every six months of things like this, right? Mm -hmm. like, who, who, beautiful man, normal, right? I, my family on that time was not like, like, oh, just get back together or just try to solve it. First of all, the Sandy Merriman was donated from a drug addict woman that owned that house. Okay. To the government to shelter women. Because she knew she already sheltered women. She was a very friendly woman and I, so I was really like, Oh my god, like like coming from Spain, like really uh, <laughs> in so, Spain you work or you die. <laughs> yeah. Basically. <Okay. laughs> that's it. <laughs> like that, that that that's it in Spain. Like in many countries. The the shelters, they are, of course, they are shelters, but not like this. Mm -hmm. Some women live there two years, <laughs> coming in and out. Oh, wow. Okay. Like, in the attic is the woman that sleep in the night, the woman that are not insulting or that, and they want to recover, get another job. Um, I was thinking after talking to you that all the women in St. Mary men, you know, you know, we might have... Whatever, many reasons, mental illness, drug addiction, uh, severe mental illness, whatever, it can be many reasons, but we all have one thing in common, and that's bad relationship with men. Okay? Okay. <laughs> so, um, maybe because of all this, or, or whatever reason, um, it's always that giggling of, of female gossiping in the in the attic because the, the the ladies the ladies in Canada are so nice you know they're so nice like um, that shelter ha people that have really, really problems with whatever their attitude but in the attic you had that jolly feeling when somebody came so they feel at home and talking what happened to you and they were really open you know Okay, first of all, Emma is not a girl that goes into shelters like all her life. I was first in the shelter. She was the most educated girl, maybe not only the shelter, but Victoria. Like, like she never hung out with the homeless in the streets. People come from Canada to, 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 to smoke meth 
and they're in the streets because of the weather. It's a nice weather. So, and you, I don't, I've never seen Emma. She would never be with anyone, basically. That's from the shelter. She, so she was very shy. She was the proper girl that is very like conservative, you know, like she's, she has her life. You have yours, you know, like those are private things. And she wouldn't say that, mm -hmm. but you know, it's like I, I, I guess it would be ashamed to just say it, mm -hmm. coming from where she's coming from. Mm. So I spoke about my life, and I was really, really like trying to make her see or laugh about my situation. Maybe she tells me, and I do remember very well. She was coming because her. I, I asked Emma, "Why are you here?" I don't remember. She said her boyfriend, or or I think it was her boyfriend. Mm. But I, I, uh, someone was talking her and, and, and made her uh, stop. Uh, so that way, she had to stop working. Hmm. She came. I don't think she said stalking, uh, but it was bothering her. I don't remember the words. I think she said, "My." A boyfriend or uh, I wish I remember well but it, it had something to do with a guy just, or, that she that she would, had a bad relationship in some context I think it was she said it was her boyfriend was following her and bothering her and she had to stop working wow well. she she was there because of that I don't know the police must have access to the files because they ask us why we come in the shelter uh, and what kind of relationship did you have with Emma? So you, you mentioned you were like in the attic was it seemed like more mature kind of women living there and more stable. You met Emma there. What kind of relationship did you have? Would you consider her your friend? A friend, not even an acquaintance. Because uh, I mean, I had a connection with her because I'm also vegetarian, turning into vegan, went very hard. <laughs> and she was exceptionally beautiful so uh, you don't need to be an artist to recognize beauty like um and all the girls too like in the kitchen when they they're eating and then emma comes to make her eyes and her food and we would just look at her like what are you doing in here you come from a fairy tale because she has that like whimsical something about her that's very like i mean in the scenario especially of the shelter because the 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 woman there 80 percent look very ugly like non-care the they just gave up whatever the, the, she had the thing that was like here i am well and they're up here but you know it's you know you're humans too something like that she wouldn't say it but you could see her goodness in in her People calling her a hippie and all this, like, no, Emma was not a hippie. Like, she looked like a lady that could be married today. What, like, as far as the way Emma was, what was your impression about her lifestyle? Like, you had told me you don't believe she was living a life of homelessness. Did you have any sense of what her life was like outside of the interactions you'd have with her in the shelter? She absolutely looked like someone who was running away. She, she... You know, more or less, you could tell by the, the the characteristics. But she she was very like afraid. That's not no. She's not the girl that you would see in a shelter at all. Okay. And you had explained to me um, you felt like this was a vulnerable time in Emma's life. Is when you say that, is there any particular thing about her that you felt made her vulnerable? Like uh, some people would say. That, that believe Emma was mentally ill would say she was vulnerable because of, you know, illness. Um, but I know you don't I believe... I'm not a psychiatrist to... I'm not a psychiatrist. I hope you find a psychiatrist to give you more or less an idea mm -hmm. of what the picture was. Yeah. Did you feel like she was someone that maybe was not safe for, for some reason? I'm not saying Emma had mental illness because what she was put through... Let's see who would end up with fear. Yeah. 
So, um, it's like you're going to see a movie, a horror movie, and then you, the woman is uh, whatever, looks crazy, right? And now everyone's saying that, the, you know, like, the, that woman is crazy. Mm -hmm. That woman, in Canada, no, I don't know, in Victoria, everybody says that people have mental illness like it's normal. In Spain, only a doctor says that. Mm -hmm. Like, people don't say that about mm -hmm. anyone. Yeah, I, we're naturally crazy also, so we allowed our part of ourselves to be in the to, to talk nonsense in our arts. So we have sympathy about letting ourselves be loose. In Canada, in Canada, it's like everyone has to be really nice, and and then you have if somebody is looking at the stars or pushing the leaves in the fall because he loves nature. Like, I really want to be here just to say how much I hate Canadians for that. Yeah. And now, Americans in YouTube. Mm, I, I understand. Calling this beautiful, innocent girl, like, oh, this is Italy. Oh, yeah, because, like, oh, like, like, what is that? Mm -hmm. It's so disgusting. Yeah, and that's something you made really clear to me from the beginning is you don't believe that Emma was suffering from any kind of me mental illness. Um, I, but you also mentioned I think to me, she had her reasons to be suffering or, mm -hmm. you know, like. You know, there, there's an, a part of Emma's story that you were involved in and you were there for that I really want to hear you talk about. And that is that in the days just prior to Emma's disappearance, it seemed like she was considering going home to her mom in Ontario. And then there was her, the plan for her mom to come and get her. There was some, there's some debate about whether Emma knew that her mother was coming and if she did know how she yeah, found Emma out. Yeah, Emma knew she was coming. Emma knew, okay. I was, I was, I was worried for Emma because I could see her state was, I don't know, like Jesus. <laughs> Let, let's say what Jesus says, I'm not of this, my kingdom is not of this world. Something like that. Emma was somewhere else. Emma was in another world, okay? She was taking the sunshine. I do meditation, okay? Mm -hmm. I've been in India, I've done meditation for 40 years. I could be dance four hours in silence. And I know she was not in this world. You know, I'm coming with my files, like if I'm uh, trying to get my kids and she's taking the sun. I'm not going to say that's mental illness to be in another world. She's, she's enjoying the sun. She was with no drug addicts, never hanging out with anyone. Talk, she, that was natural. Maybe created by the mind <laughs> or lack of, I don't know. She slept always in the shelter world. Okay. Mm -hmm. What takes to the man to flip is all those triggers. Putting her in the streets, she is being followed by someone. She, she, she. The, you know what happens when if I'm screaming and threatened to you, th that stays here. Mm -hmm. That stays here, again and again. So a way to to sometimes avoid crisis is just to disconnect, man. You know. Just, huh. Uh, go try to be positive. Well, look at the sunshine. I didn't know anything. I just really thought um, this is the, the tree in front of the courthouse and you cross the street and there is an environment and there is Emma sitting in the sunshine like a little Buddha, you know. The volunteers call her the golden girl. Um... She will, you, you could see her, her face totally delighted. She would, we would share words because, you know, I would perceive her, you know, you, you just don't approach someone like that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know if the person maybe, you know, is reading a book or it wants to be in conversation or stop the book or she wants to stop the sunshine. She was not reading it, but what I mean is that so there is a little bit of movement and then you know if there is a gesture i say hello so it w that was always like that you know when you're walking and you feel someone behind yeah some people do some don't emma would okay. all right <laughs> emma would so we have an instinct and um I, I told 
I want to look for the library to reach her family. I miss my family so much. Yeah, you try, you know, to redirect. I miss my family so much. I mean, they're so annoying, you know, like, because I could tell, like, uh, you know, like, she has to, yeah, we're so different, my family, you know, things like that, because I, I know your pride when you are doing your life. You're young. <laughs> it's like, so you can imagine, right? I don't have something dark, mm -hmm. right? I don't have any evidence. This is nothing she told me. I only told Shelly this and uh, some volunteers. Cause it's, it, this is talking crazy, like a crazy shit. Mm -hmm, that's okay. <laughs> All right. She she had something that I cannot talk about this because is she she I could see it I could see it. I cannot talk because it's it's not reasonable you know but she when she was sitting there I saw her like like is this really this is in slow motion this all this information can happen in three seconds all right but. As I approach, but I'm telling you this. This is dark. Okay, this is hard to say. I cannot say this, but okay. So I I felt like her body was, or soul was just not really like in this realm, right? Like this, uh, you know, like uh, she was disattached, and she never has ever said anything crazy. Okay, what I'm telling you is my own uh, impression. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that I have seen it not like a, like a person, but I have saw it like a force. The she, and then she recognized she's blind, but she can she can run away from it. Like she she's just is always there. And um, just this is creepy. Okay, she look at me. Now she look at me like, you know, then I surrender and I'm going to be famous. Okay, this is creepy. But this, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly has her, I mean, she, she, she says, yeah, Emma has that side of her. But I'm not saying it's mental illness, okay? I'm really telling you that's uh, like uh, something, uh, something. And... She could. Uh, it was like she could uh, escape from it. Within the day of her disappearance, like that morning or the night before, she was aware her mother was coming, as you mentioned. Did she seem like she was panicked or upset about her mom coming, or did she communicate any of anything she about was, that? She was both. She loved the idea of her mother coming. You could see she had a good childhood and connection with her mother, and. Then she like skip her eyes away, like you know. But she she never talked about about anyone. Mm -hmm. But you could only catch by her facial expression. By then, she. By then the change like all the by then her change, it was drastic. Like the Emma uh, standing straight, she would be more like this. Yeah. A physical position like this and she she would have forgotten some things like she forgot that I lived in the shelter because I told her I could help you and take you with me and she like kind of hung to my arm I don't know if I took her by but she, I remember but her physical position changed she was looking for help and she was not them she, she's starting to talk, walk with plastic bags uh, up and down from the street of the shelter. They were worried about her. Mm -hmm. So she didn't remember in her mind state then, she didn't remember that I am also in the shelter, that I don't have nowhere to take her. That So she told me, yeah, can I go with you? Like, like, like she thought I had a home. You have one week emergency bed every three months, regardless if you're coming in or out every month. I think you have to be out 
for one month. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But I know every month your bed is taken out. You have to go out. The other shelter is full of man, drug addicts, and, and it's, hor- it's horrendous because they look like zombies. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, nobody cares. Was one person telling me, "Yeah, we're calling the mother, but this is out of the book because they, they shouldn't reach." I explain them. Look, you have to get. Oh, I can't explain this well. I need to take some 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 medication to relax my anxiety for this interview. It's okay. When when I ask them for the bed, they say they're going to give her the bed. And I, I push forward. I said, she only needs food space to relax and recover. Like this, she could she, she could not return. People like this could not, the mind could get stuck there, not return. She, she was not talking crazy things. She was not, uh, she was, I, I know something in her mind because she didn't remember that I don't have a house to bring her. Mm-hmm. I understand. So, and her body, and I mean, I, okay, they're calling her mother, but they're not giving her a bed. Like, what kind of protocol is that, right? So, okay, I come again with Emma. We are sitting the stairs that go up. The attic is the third floor. But, we're sitting on the stairs that is in front of the office that is in the entrance because they said we have to wait. That I don't remember her name. She was chubby in her 30s. She was really like, maybe she was the one trying. And they had like something going on. But they make this way in the stairs, sitting there. And Emma was starting to retract more and more. When you and her are, are waiting on the stairs, how, how did it end? I understand. That was she- a scenario. And another one coming in, maybe, you know, like a, you know, like a rock, tra- white trash, that maybe she has so many men and drugs, that there's just another ordinary day there to go there and complain to the office. And then a third. We're sitting there in the stairs waiting for what? An emergency bed that they're going to kick her out in one week anyways. The fear was great. You could feel the fear in Emma. And I was really like, I'm, how am I going to do? Because I was also starting to feel afraid, you know? Because uh, I don't want to lose her. But at that moment, I, I could feel her fear because she was already, like, uh, retracting, all right? Emma didn't grow up in an aggressive environment to, to deal through that, <laughs> okay? Which most of the girls in the environment... We're prepared to just be there and, you know, the, you, you come from another environment as well. How, how safe do you feel? Mm-hmm. So, so tell me about Emma running out of the shelter. I've, I've always known this story of her running out and you chasing after her, but I've never heard it in any detail. Can you tell me about when she gave up waiting for an emergency bed and fled? So she yeah. runs out. I run after because... I was sharing the fear of Emma. I was sharing the fear of Emma. I don't know why, but nobody was watching. No one, no one cared. So she runs out. I run after. You know, there's this gap of grass. Victoria has this beautiful grass that goes along with the walking street. I mean, in Europe, that's a luxury. <laughs> So I just, I just stop because I am really like, so I stop and here's in the environment, there is the walk, the, all this grass, the courthouse is here and she's running straight towards the hotel where I didn't know she had her van or car, I didn't know she had one. Well, I was running after her, but I was, what I'm going to do? I wanted to take her, you know? I wanted to take her and just bring her back. But, you know, I'm a Spanish person. I'm not, I'm like an immigrant. I, I, I don't want problems with the police. And even, it's illegal to take someone like that against their will. Mm-hmm. So, she, she will return tomorrow, I guess, you know. Mm-hmm. But it was the fall, so 
it was for me it was a moment also this moment that the time goes very slow and it creeped me again because it was like a movie i told you that was like she she had a light uh, coloring clothes i don't know i don't know gray but with her blonde hair she she didn't have a braid with all the shoes so it looked like you know it was dark the darkness of the night she didn't look to the sides to cross the street running without shoes so she looked like a soul <laughs> mm-hmm. i mean she looked like a ghost or someone that's not of this world i really remember like oh this is creepy you know like uh, she's beautiful um, i i was like i know you will return and she she was like no <laughs> hey that but that was that was an impression like an impression she didn't say no i didn't hear no but i did think you know like you will return like mm-hmm. but what's the the thing i think in her mind she she okay, the the social workers not taking care of me when i need it i still today feel her fear from that moment How did you find out she was missing? Did you remember learning that she hadn't come? You know, next day was the police there and the mother. <laughs> it was the daytime. Mm. So I come, I think I came to eat because I would go there to eat. There was the police and there was the, the, the oh no, yeah, because she was moving things. No, no, like really, really. And I'm like, really? Of course her mother was would be there she would have taken her like you know she would have even maybe taken her to a new place if she didn't want to go home you know or make her life you know the police is there i was a woman from a shelter and a spanish person mm. so it doesn't matter what you know it doesn't matter the police never took my report The mother at that time was kind of like shocked that her daughter was in a shelter so I was another woman from a shelter. <laughs> But the 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 issue here is that the shelter lied about Emma moving things. They put her in the streets. They didn't give her a bed when she had the right to have an emergency bed immediately. Cuz she was vulnerable. Why was she vulnerable? Because she's been stuck. She told me she's she she. That's why she was there. She left her job and everything because of that. The, the police believe the shelter because they work for the government. They believe the reports of the shelter, so they are they are looking at a woman that you know that, that it changes the world picture. Oh. The, the, this is a lie. The shelter did a big mistake here. And the police has to know. The police has to know the real situation of Emma Filippo. This was not Emma. I think she had the right to be afraid. And fear doesn't let you think well, I guess. You know. Let me ask, like, as much as you know about Emma in her time, just prior to her disappearance, have you ever come up with any opinion on? where you think she is or what may have happened do you have any idea <laughs> of course i know i don't know, only mm-hmm. have an idea i will only need the evidence to take me there so what is it well i i wish the police and the investigation follow the clues it's too easy to see that <laughs> It's very easy, even if you were not there. So, you know. Yeah, this was this uh, has been amazing. You you answered a lot of the questions that I had I about know. about that period of time in Emma's life. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's my obsession. Well, there's no question that you were there at some pivotal moments, and 
you, you did the right thing by trying to get help for Emma. Thank you anyways to Cindy Merriman who gave me shelter. Um, thank you to the people in Canada. Thank you to the volunteers who are still there. Um, thanks to you, really. And for Julian. I don't know. Whoa. What? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the you could be you could be so much to the world in this plane. I thank you for talking to me. Bye. Hold, what? Hold on. What? Mm, yeah. What her exact yeah, so- words were, and I'm sorry to Julian. I'm sorry you could be so much in this plane. That's what that's Wait, what she said. is that what she said? Have you listened to that several times? Yeah. And it's when you it's it may have seemed like when you listen there that I kinda like I just heard thank you to up. Julian. Like I didn't really hear the I'll play the final part can again. You play, can you play that can you just play that again? Yeah, it, and it sounds a bit like I'm jumping in, but what ended up happening was there was a big long silence that I clipped out of there. Um, yeah. And it was to me, I felt like at this part of the conversation, it was over. It was over, but she was very clearly, like, cautiously choosing her words. So I like, I can only, th- in my mind, absolutely, she has something she wanted to say that didn't come out because it was her- okay. Well, let's can, can yeah. you footnote that because I want to come back to that earlier in the, the, the clips, too. Yeah. Cool. So let's listen this is to fucking that. I'm wild. Gonna, Pardon my French. Jeez. I'm gonna listen to that part one more time. Yeah, I want to hear that again. Play it again. Love. Oh, okay, one sec. Where we go? Even if you were not there, so no. Yeah, this was. This uh, has been amazing. You you answered a lot of the questions that I had I about know. about that period of time in Emma's life. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe. It's my obsession. Well, there's no question that you were there at some pivotal moments, and you you did the right thing by trying to get help for Emma. Thank you, anyways, to Cindy Merriman who gave me shelter. Um, That's so bizarre. Thank you to the people in Canada. Thank you to the volunteers who are still there. Here it comes. Um, thanks to you, really, and okay. for Julian. Okay, so did know. you ask her? Did you not follow up? Did you not ask her why? Thank I you, Julie. I'm like, sorry. Because th- that that sounds like a, 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 a an acceptance speech. Like that's very much like. Okay, so you did you ask her about that at all after? Like, why? You know, how did you how did you know Julian at least? I did. Um, she and where did it go from there? She knew. She knew who he was. She knew the story. Um, and I and I asked her if she was why she mentioned him when she was giving her thanks and she didn't answer that question like did Um, she just totally skirt it or did she just go on talked about other unrelated things um and i asked several times and at this point our reception was getting as bad as it was and you're like two and a half hours and and we were we were an hour and 40 minutes into a what was supposed to be a 45 minute talk um, but that was like a mm. really important part. So I, I, um, I tried to get more out of her, but really like what you hear there is the, the best that I had. Okay. So from this interview with Patty here, we learn a bit. We learned, so Patty stated she knew her mother was coming and that she had mixed feelings about it. So she liked it and was excited on one side, and then there was also some reservation. Patty also clearly stated that there's a, or the general after the the interviewers that are interviewing her, there's no sense that Emma Filipov was having a mental breakdown or there were any mental issues 
specifically in that direction because, again, that's what it's been painted at from the outside. And a lot of people kind of latched onto that. But again, I never really bought that from the beginning. Now, again, I'm not saying that there wasn't a mental health issue. I'm just not, I'm just saying I don't see any conclusive evidence of that. So there's, there's no real reason to believe that. Again, the burden of proof is always on the positive claims. I mean, it's logic 101. Yeah, anybody could be having a mental breakdown at any time. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying anyone is or isn't. But if you're going to believe the positive, if you're going to, that positive claim, she's having mental health issues, she's paranoid, etc. Maybe, maybe not. But there's just not enough evidence to definitively believe that. And it seems like every single person that's been coming out has been corroborating that. And the other issue here, so she's being kicked out of the shelter. That's pretty alarming. Is this part of the reason the shelter doesn't want to say anything? I mean, she's using the main office for various phone calls, Emma Filipov is. And so that's the reason she went out and got the burner phone. I mean, it's starting to make more sense now. She's being kicked out of the shelter here for these various issues. Now, again, Patty's English is not perfect, so some of it is a little bit difficult, and her level of understanding of all these things and, and being able to clearly elucidate her ideas and everything she knows. And again, we don't really know Patty's history. She seems like she's trying to be honest, though. So, I mean, again, as far as I can tell, it's just there are certain, obviously, roadblocks in that direction. She also, I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking to even listen to this interview on how scared Emma was. Like, she could feel her fear and that's uh i mean this is scary stuff this is scary stuff and so she's clearly distraught on on a certain level regarding this and there also seems to be something going on in the background that patty picked up on but we don't have exact details here because emma again she she's a private person uh, as described by many people so she's not just going to tell everybody her business so there's something going on in the background and it's very clear a lot of people do not believe it is a mental health issue so the burner phone that she's getting, or, you know, not burner phone, the phone she's getting so she could make phone calls because she's getting kicked out of the shelter, allegedly, if this is what is going on here. Now, on the Nighttime Podcast YouTube regarding this episode with Patty, there are some interesting comments here by Ian W., I think we have to take what Patty says with a grain of salt and understand that she may have negative experiences with the shelter, and so she may have a motive to dispute their narrative. That being said, I do believe her in that regard, because if she had a negative experiences with the shelter, it makes me believe that some shady stuff was happening there. It makes perfect sense to me that they made Emma look disruptive via moving furniture out into the street as a means to justify giving her the boot. And, I mean, that's really messed up. Someone should dig into their policy surrounding disruption. In terms of after she fled, to me it's a no-brainer why she picked up a prepaid credit card and burner phone. She obviously didn't want her movement to be traced electronically, but also because she no longer could use the office phone at the shelter. The bigger question is, who would have access to her accounts to see where purchases were made? It's not uncommon for millennials to be supported by their parents late into their 20s, and given her lifestyle, I imagine her parents supported her financially to some degree. Perhaps she didn't want her parents tracking her whereabouts throughout her credit card statement. Since she had no address, the bill may have been sent to her parents. All signs point to her avoiding her parents in my mind. She knew her mother was coming to pick her up. I personally believe she was like, okay, I'm going to go get a room at a hostel or hotel for the night and she wanted to use an alias. I'm reaching, maybe, but that's what I think. There's nothing there to suggest she didn't anticipate being around anymore. She borrowed library books, meaning she intended to read them and return them. She left her personal belongings in her van and bought a phone, obviously, for future use. I wonder if the phone was ever used. Now, Miss Bean respond, or uh, M. Bean responded here. She picked up the credit card and prepaid phone before trying to get a bed at the shelter. The prepaid phone has never been used. They investigated that. It's only the credit card that supposedly an alcoholic used some days later who first claimed to have found it at the Wand Center and then said he had no idea how he got it. So there, some people are disputing this because, yeah, I mean, we really don't know the timeline of the shelter, though. Did she really pick up the uh, prepaid card and phone before the issues at the shelter? But we really don't know. 
I mean, I just another heartbreaking comment here from Suzanne. She tried to call her mom for help a few times. Even though she tried to fix her problems herself, she seemed to be in that place that she could not get around the fact that she needed help. I think she purchased the phone so that she could contact help, her mom, whenever it would get too bad. Unfortunately, it seems she never got the chance to call for help. And after learning that her mom was coming, she was relieved, but maybe her irritation came from the fact that she was worried about someone hurting her mom. And thus, she planned to leave somewhere safe and then calling her mom. And that's, I mean, yeah, that that's a crazy theory. And, and th thus, even more heartbreaking on how, if that's true, that means Emma Filipov was, of course, thinking of the needs of others ahead of her own. And also that there may have been someone in her life or more than one someone who was stalking her or possibly trying to harm her. Or at least she thought that that was the case, even if it wasn't. Huh. Pamela has a comment here. She was very frugal, hence she would never spend hundreds of dollars on a hotel room. It's most likely the reason that she stayed at the shelter. I have a friend with over 400000 in her bank account, and she will sleep in her car while traveling. Interesting comment there from Pamela. Angie posted that Patty is suspicious. Again, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of issues here. The shelter does seem to be pretty shady. I'm going to go over another issue here. This is uh, also from Reddit several years ago. Someone posted this. Wasn't there talk of her working for an escort agency or taking an interest in that kind of work around the time she went missing? Also, someone mentioned her seeing her in Spain with the exact location. That information has been quickly removed, but why? Again, I'm not claiming any of this is true or untrue. These are just posts on Reddit. Renee posted this. Yes, Charlie's Angels Escort Service. There was mention that she may have been in contact with this place or people the afternoon of her disappearance. Also, Charlie's Angels was mentioned in her emails and or journals. And is this... One of, the uh, one of the smoking gun pieces of evidence the PI was referring to. And, and yes, there are many things that suddenly go missing from the Facebook page, Help Find Emma, if people ask too many questions. If they have theories that do not coincide with what the mother wants to portray of Emma. All I am saying is that there is a lot of very important information being hidden, which is absolutely crazy. This information could be the key to finding Emma. Many people from many walks of life involved in different ways. All these people putting their thoughts together and bumping ideas uh, off one another is fabulous. Unfortunately, it isn't allowed to happen. Only if you agree with what the mother wants are you allowed to make comments. The mother is hiding information and trying to control how Emma is seen and what information is out there. She pushes mental illness and a loving relationship. Emma left home at 16. Her and her mother have not seen each other in person for well over a year. They hadn't even spoke on the phone for over a year up until days prior to the disappearance. The mother is making it out to be that the family was all butterflies and roses. It was dysfunctional. The brother was involved in heavy-duty drugs and the drugs being hidden in the mother's home without her knowing question mark. The father marrying a girl younger than Emma. Is that true? There are so many possibilities, so many hidden secrets. It is unfortunate when hundreds of, if not more, people have dedicated years or months to Emma's search only to be told partial truth. It is a waste of people's precious time. If Emma is to be found, the mother is the key. She needs to let out the truth and trying to control what people think of Emma. Emma was an artsy, creative, wandering soul, not a family-oriented person, as the mother says. And where was the family? Why have the siblings, father, or extended family ever helped with search efforts? Question mark. And do we know that they haven't? I mean, I don't know. It would be curious to get more information from other friends and relatives of Emma back home and if they, you know, what they say. Here's another cryptic post on the Help Find Emma Filipoff page. This was posted in 2014. I was in the shell I was there in the shelter and I have tried much to bring consciousness about her state. She had a mental breakdown and day by day more paranoia. If the other is aware if the way she truly wanted to run away and was so afraid, she wanted her mother to come and in a second she was very afraid. And it is the truth no one has listened to me. She would not go to a male's shelter, she avoided men. She was running away for her freedom, running away from something, and I will bring 
discrimination for the system and the way mental health, social workers, and even parents don't find healthy solutions to people who are touched by a certain divine or they are much different and possible to control, caregivers and institutions make it worse. I was enchanted by the beauty of this girl and wished to care so much for her and no one listened. Perhaps so difficult to understand. Emma did not belong to this earth, social reality. She was in a realm of sunshine, taking sunshine under the tree before that breakdown. Emma did not consume any drugs and never hung out with anyone that did. She went to the gym as I had told her to go. I did not wish her to be among the people in the shelter. Now the mother asked for her daughter, I asked for truth, and to advocate for new laws in the system so people like her don't have to end in this way. When she vanished running before my eyes, I could not believe what I had been seeing, but I had been seeing an angel, an angel tortured by something against her nature, and she would not give her nature away. All my respect and wishes of glory to see her reunited with such a beautiful daughter, I could tell she was a very well-educated young female and came from much love. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to not know where she is. And thank you for this space. The ladies from the shelter wanted to reunite every month before the Empress just to pray for her return. I was helping to organize this event, but I'm not in Victoria now. Okay, so it doesn't seem like English is this person's first language. So she was at the shelter, but she didn't want Emma to be among the ladies in the shelter because some, I mean, why? Was something weird going on in the shelter? But then again, or by the people who run the shelter and not the people staying at the shelter. Is that what that means? Because she's saying that she helped organize events from the ladies from the shelter that reunited. So is did she mean that the people running the shelter are the people that she didn't want Emma to be part of or around? What does that mean? So, okay, this is mind shock. So I am going to float this last dark theory here. Is it possible that one individual, or possibly more than one, at the women's shelter was possibly procuring women for the escort service? Or served as some kind of liaison? Not necessarily against their will, but just offered options for money, which is, of course, I mean, I don't know, that's probably not a good thing to do to people who are you know, in that state in their life, because, I mean, I don't know, it's just, it's so weird, the whole thing's so weird, or were they coerced into some kind of escort services, and for the, for the, for the people, for the women who were staying at the shelter that possibly know of this link, if there is a link, again, I'm not alleging there is or isn't a link here, but if there is, or maybe possibly Emma was considering it, ultimately refused whatever, which caused some issues, and then they wanted to harm her because of that. Or maybe they were just trying to strong-arm her in the first place into this line of work that she didn't want to be in. Is that a possibility? Or did she unknowingly find something out about the shelter and their connections to something possibly criminal, or if not criminal, at the very least, shady? Is that a possibility? And they used any excuse they could to just kick her out of the shelter at that point. I, and how much do we really know of, of, like, all these activities at the shelter at all in the first place? I mean, it's just, th this is such a major question mark, and the fact that investigation wasn't done. Now, if you want to go really crazy on the corruption conspiracy angle, if the police know about it and they're getting kickbacks, of course they're not going to investigate this. Now, to all the coincidence theorists that say that would never happen, I mean, come on. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is corruption within police and government agencies, and it does involve human trafficking. Again, in the post-Epstein era the post-Jeffrey Epstein, Jill Zane Maxwell era, coincidence theorists really don't have a leg to stand on while trying to pretend and hallucinate that this kind of corruption can't and doesn't exist. So if there is some kind of shady corruption situation with shelters, not just that one, but other shelters, and possibly the police, and possibly... I mean, this is like... This is just like a really, really scary conspiratorial movie because the police that talked to Emma... So they never released that, in, they don't want to release any information on Emma or that case. Is that because there was some kind of situation between the shelter and possibly an escort agency and possibly some kind of connections to crime which may or may not intersect uh, political areas? Is that a possibility? This is mind shock. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure and the truth is not afraid of investigation. So I'm going to leave everyone with those thoughts to ponder on just more theories. 
on what could have happened. And I still, I, I think the shelter and the van and the situation with the van and her belongings in the van, I think those are the two critical pieces. I mean, there's many others, obviously the friends, friends she might have stayed with and apartments and some of their stories don't make sense. I went over that in the previous episodes. There's a lot of weird stuff going on in the case. Now, and I'm not saying the weird stuff is directly connected to the disappearance. I'm, I'm saying it's difficult to know which weird stuff would be connected. It's kind of hard to say none of the weird stuff in any of these issues are connected. I mean, it's, it would seem at least one of them would be the avenue that would be connected to her disappearance. And, uh, yeah, so I'm going to leave you guys with that. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Emma Filipoff series. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comments section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.